Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church of Farmington. Uh, let's see. The deacons are going to coordinate a collection of non-perishable items. They flew by on the screen, and there are printouts available on the tables by either exit from the sanctuary. This is uh, going to be... Um, to assist the Feed, Farmers Feeding Farmers program as they provide children and youth uh, food for the Christmas break. So easy to fix breakfast and lunches. Cop, uh, so let's see, we need to have, have them here by December 8th. December 8th is the due date. There should be boxes somewhere out in the fellowship hall. I didn't look to see if they're there yet or not. Um, the session meets on Thursday at 6 p.m., so get your reports to Pat as soon as you can this week. And we're volunteering at the food pantry this Wednesday from 11 to 1. If you're going to come and help, let Bonnie know. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.
I will say that with my loud voice, they were having so much fun that a lot of times they couldn't even hear me, which was amazing. I tried to keep track of the nut soups and the hot dogs that went out, and I know I didn't get all of them, but I had down 210 bowls of soup, 96 chili dogs, 42 hot dogs, and the winning soup was cheeseburger chowder. It, it sold the most. And we had a nice steady crowd. There was a crowd coming in all evening until about 6.30, so we got to clean up and get out of there early, and everything went real well. Yes, yes it did. Yep, hang on, yep. Okay, um, so real quick, Bonnie, um, Jody, Cozy, by the time I got there at noon, they had everything chopped, ready to go. If I forgot, Stephanie was there early too, but they had everything chopped, ready to go. Lissy, Lissy. yep. It was the easiest soup dinner I've ever done. Sam was there too. I mean, like I showed up, they were like, here's all the stuff you need for your soup. Here's everything ready to go. They shot for everything. It was amazing. And it was the best soup dinner I've ever worked. We had so much fun. It, you guys, you did awesome. Like it was so, it was perfect. It was the best one yet, so. Yay. Um, can you pass that to Jody? Turn it back on. They're asking how much money do you know, Jody? Okay. I just want to say thank you to everybody. I'm not a speaker, so I hope everybody understands what I'm saying because it never comes out of my mouth like it's in my head. <laughs> but um, this soup supper was everybody's soup supper. And um, I can't tell you how great it was because there were people that couldn't be there that donated money so we could get supplies and, you know, donated time, baked goods. I mean, literally everybody in this church was a part of this. And with that being said, um, we made $1,801. That's before a couple of expenses, but we're still probably very close to buying three plane tickets for Guardians, which is huge. And um, almost double what we did last year when you talk about, because last year we didn't take any expenses out. Oh, so. Okay. Uh, over double what we did last year, which is awesome. huge. And I will tell you, um, saw a lot of faces that none of us knew, so a lot of people from the outside. And everybody talked about how fun we were and how fun it was. And I will tell you from being here 19 years, this felt wonderful. And it truly felt like this was an act of God. Like it, it really was because we had whole families that were there and I've never been in such a stress-free, fun environment. Um, Bonnie and I were casting out Satan all day. <laughs> so, and he did not walk through that door. <laughs> and, uh, no, well, you can do that with Steve. <laughs> but, um, but I just, like I said, I thank everybody. And this committee and the soup supper truly is everybody. There's no I in it. It was everybody. Thank you very much for being here. All right, I wouldn't turn it off yet, I don't know. Uh, let's see, next Sunday we're decorating for Advent and Christmas following worship, so we hope everybody can stay, the more, the faster it goes, so. Uh, this is, sorry, what? There should be a meal then probably. Yeah, meal and hot dogs and crafts for the children. Okay, so there will be a meal there will be hot dogs and crafts for the children, and the adults can come in here and decorate. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so this is the time to bring your children and grandchildren and whatnot to Sunday school so they can practice for the Christmas program. Bonnie, how many kids do we have here today? 18. 18. And there's more on the way. More on the way. Um, so if you didn't receive materials from Bonnie this morning, um, reach out to her, she'll get you a copy, um, if you know of somebody who wasn't here. Let Pat Walker know if you're planning to attend the cookie exchange and luncheon on Friday, December 13th. <coughs> Other announcements? Lily? Sit down. Should I 
He was just trying to get it going. <laughs> okay. No other announcements? My friends, if you would like to participate in the peace of Christ, I invite you to stand now. The peace of Christ be with you. join in the call to worship, I was reminded to invite you all to stay for fellowship because there's tons of desserts out there just waiting to be gobbled up. So if you are able, please stand. You notice when we come to worship, oh God, your heart is warmed by our praise. You notice when we respond to your word, O oh God. Your heart is warmed when we go your way. You notice when we notice the downtrodden. Your heart is warmed when we work with them for change. You notice each one of us and know us by name. Your heart is warmed when we bring glory to your name. Our opening hymn is number 612, We Praise You, O God.
trusting in the grace of God, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbors. Let us pray together. Grant us the gift of humility. When we catch ourselves showing off, humble us. When we insist on our own way, transform us. When we downplay the gifts of others, correct us. When we have inflated expectations, deflate us. Grant us the gift of humility, O God, and in talking less and serving more, in boasting less and praying more, humble us. As you work quietly yet effectively, as you follow the way of Christ and the serving saints, you will know the peace of God reserves for the humble. We will rejoice, for God's pardon will be ours. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're going to keep this short today, I think, right? So, what? what you, you, a lot of you were at Sunday school today, right? Yeah. What are we getting ready for? It's a, the program. Program for what? Christmas. Cri Christmas. Oh my gosh, Christmas! Are we almost ready for Christmas? Yeah. Oh my goodness. You coming up, Will? Come on. Come on. Oh, I'm not going to bite. <laughs> yes. <laughs> After what? After church, we're going to decorate our house. Oh, yeah? We might. You might? We might. 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 Okay. So we're getting ready for Christmas. Who was, whose birthday are we celebrating with Christmas? Whose? Yes. No. You and, oh, yours? Huh? This is right before Christmas. This is right before Christmas? Celebrating Andy's birthday. Awesome. Awesome. Who else's birthday? Yes, sir. Well, well, yes. Do you think you had the right answer, Hexen? Yeah. Yeah, he did. He did. Do you know that we're going to start getting ready for Christmas officially next Sunday when we, what are we doing to the church? Yes. 
Danica. Yeah, we're going to hang the greens. We're going to decorate. It'll be so much fun. And then we'll have some food. We'll play some music. We'll have lots of fun. What do you think about that? Yeah. You ready to do that? Yeah. Okay. And every week we're going to light special candles. One's for oh. hope oh. and joy and peace and love. Yeah, and next week we're going to have, I'm going to try to have parts for you to sign up for to help light. I like your stuffy. All right, so we're getting ready for Christmas already. That's pretty cool, huh? Yes, sir. And the star goes up. The star goes up. It goes on on Christmas Eve, doesn't it? Super cool. Ready? Let's have a prayer. Everybody put your hands together. However you want, like this, like this. You can go like this if you want. Bow your head, close your eyes. God, we thank you so much that you sent baby Jesus into the world and that he grew into an awesome man who we love and who we learn from all the time as we read our Bible. We thank you for creating our whole world, and we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can...
Our gospel lesson for this morning comes from the gospel according to Mark, chapter 12, verses 38 through 44. Hear the good news. As he was teaching, he said, watch out for the legal experts. They like to walk around in long robes. They want to be greeted with honor in the markets. They long for places of honor in the synagogues and at banquets. They are the ones who cheat widows out of their homes, and to show off, they say long prayers. They will be judged most harshly. Jesus sat across from the collection box for the temple treasury and observed how the crowd gave their money. Many rich people were throwing in lots of money. One poor widow came forward and put in two small copper coins worth a penny. Jesus called to his disciples, called his disciples to him and said, I assure you that this poor widow has put in more than everyone who's been putting money in the treasury. All of them are giving out of their spare change, but she from her hopeless poverty has given everything she had, even what she needed to live on. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a story told about an old monk named Brother Leo. He was sent by the bishop to serve at a monastery in the French countryside. Brother Leo was so humble and so humble looking that immediately upon his arrival at the monastery, they knew exactly how to use him. He was put to work in the kitchen to wash the other monks' dishes and to mop the floors and to weed the gardens. And faithfully and quietly, Leo did all these thankless tasks for months. And the monks grew accustomed to seeing Leo carrying out the evening garbage and raking the grounds. Finally, the bishop came to visit the monastery, and he asked the monks who greeted him, where's Brother Leo? You know Brother Leo? Of course I know Leo, said the bishop. I sent him to be the new abbot of this monastery. What Brother Leo did and what the widow in our text this morning did are both unexpected, illogical behaviors, nonsensical in a way. Leo was so driven by his humility that he allowed the people he was supposed to lead give him orders and treat him like a lowly servant. The poor widow gave up her only means to eat that day so that her sense of piety might be satisfied. Does that seem a little upside down to you? It seems like it would be more important to administrate a church than do the dishes, right? It would seem to be more important to keep from starving than it would to give a huge, rich church your last penny, right? Their priorities seemed a little upside down and misguided to most of us. But most of what Jesus did and taught seemed a little upside down then, and it still seems upside down by our societal standards today. Consider the first part of our text this morning. Jesus had been in Jerusalem for a couple of days. The day of our text was Tuesday of Holy Week. Bear that in mind. It's kind of out of season for us right now, but this text was Tuesday of Holy Week. In three days' time, Jesus was going to be arrested and crucified. But on this particular day, Jesus had gone to the temple, and the temple was the center of life in Jerusalem. Jews from all over the world were there to celebrate the Passover festival. The markets that surrounded the massive temple grounds were doing brisk business. People were everywhere. And like many other rabbis, Jesus was busy teaching his followers in the temple's outer courts. Beware of the scribes, he said. Beware of the scribes. The scribes were an educated class of people who held positions of authority in the religious leadership of the temple. It would be like saying, beware of Pastor Cindy. Beware of everybody like Pastor Cindy. 
Beware of Bonnie's son. Beware of the ministers. They knew the fine points of religious law and often used that knowledge for their own financial and political gain. According to Jesus, the scribes enjoyed prestige and status that came with their position in life. They had designer clothes. They had the best pews right up front. Unless you're Presbyterian, then they had the best pews right way in the back. <laughs> where everybody could see them as they came into the sanctuary. They had all the best tables at all of the best restaurants, if they were alive today. But then Jesus levels a vicious charge at the scribes. He says, they devour widows' houses, and they pray only for appearance's sake. In Jesus' time, the scribes were not able to get a salary for their expertise in the religious law. Their knowledge of the law was supposed to be reward enough. However, they were allowed to receive gifts from devout Jews, gifts for their housing, for their meals, and for their other comforts in life. Many of the scribes parlayed these gifts into huge estates, often at the expense of poor and devout widows of Jerusalem. And they would go to the temple, and they would pray long and pious-sounding prayers to God so that everybody could see that they were really good Jews, right? Jesus detested this hypocrisy. He accused the religious, the powerful religious and political authorities of his day of doing what was evil. And he called them out on this behavior publicly and embarrassed them and humiliated them. And the crowd listened to Jesus' condemnation of them with delight. Is it really any wonder that he ended up crucified on the cross? You see, the people that Jesus connected with were obviously not the elite and the rich and the powerful. Instead, he connected with the common people and the people on the fringe of society. The widows, the fishermen, the people of the marketplace, the people who swept out the temple, took out his garbage. Jesus, who came to Jerusalem to usher in the kingdom of God, had nothing to do with the kings and the queens and the rulers of his day. Instead, he spent his time and his energy and his life with the most ordinary people, those with torn and dirty clothes, those who had to stand in the back of the church, the people who never had any money to eat at any restaurant ever. Jesus was a poor man who ministered to the poor people by feeding them and healing them and giving them some upside-down logic. The poor widow, Jesus says, who gave less than a penny, is given more than all the wealthy people gave out of their richness. Does that make any sense by normal standards? We couldn't run this church on a penny. You couldn't support me or my family or the next pastor, let alone all the rest of the staff and their families. We couldn't pay the light bill or repair the hot water heater with a penny. For the temple in Jesus' time to function, they would have needed lots of money, just like us. Jesus' teaching doesn't make sense by normal standards. But maybe by now you've learned enough about Jesus and his faith to understand that this passage isn't just about giving. It's also about sincerity. It's also about honesty. It's also about devotion. For people like Brother Leo and the widow of our passage and for Jesus, their religion, their faith was about their life. The two cannot be separated from each other. Believers don't give in the expectation of a reward. 
They give because they thought by giving to one another, they were giving glory to God. For Brother Leo, giving of his time and his energy by washing dishes was way more important than sitting in the abbot's office and receiving his due respect from the other monks. He wasn't being taken down a notch as far as he was concerned. For the widow to give to God at such an important time as the biggest day of the year, their version of Christmas, was more important than anything else to her. For Jesus, it was more important to give his life for the sake of others than it was to be crowned as a king in a palace in Jerusalem. The upside-down logic of Jesus' teaching boils down to this. We aren't measured by how important we are or how much money we have or even by what other people think of us. We are measured by our own priorities. We are convicted or acquitted all by the simplest measure, by our priorities. It doesn't matter whether we set our priorities consciously or not. What we do with our time and our money and our talents illustrates what our priorities are. If our faith is important, then we will see it and live it out with our actions and our resources. If faith isn't important, that will be evident too. And if we don't like what our priorities have to say about us, then you know what? We're free to change that all by ourselves. We don't have to jump through hoops. We don't have to earn more money. And we don't have to become more important in any way. We just need to line up our priorities with the things of real importance. Things like trust in God, like gratitude to God, protection of the poor and the homeless, protection of the immigrant and the state stranger, protection of the widow and the orphan, to things like service and humility and authenticity and grace. That's the beauty of the upside down world of faith that the true measure of our worth has nothing to do with worldly value, but it has everything to do with our hearts. I can't, I can't wrap up this sermon without saying, when you live that way, you have the best time doing a soup supper <laughs> to benefit other people. Because you're given based on your priorities, not by how much money we have, not by how important people think you are. You're given of your time and your talent and what resources we have to help other people know what joy and gratitude and service looks like. Amen. I know we got at least one birthday man in the house. Have we got other? Oh, we do. We have other birthdays in the house. We got Tony. We got Jackson. We got Pat. Let's sit.
Yay for Cozy, by the way, so. All right, joys and concerns. Uh, Joe, can you work the microphone? Thank you. Pat's got one over here. I don't know if there's anybody over there. I just want to say that this morning I put 80 pennies in that jar. Many of those pennies represent happy years. God gave me a lot of blessings. And then he gave me a lot of trials over the years. But he's pulled me through them all. So I'm very happy that I made it to 80. Congratulations. Do you want me to share yours or do you want to? Let's see. For baby Winnie? Do you want me to? Okay. Jody. Well, I just have a joy. Um, so Blake is coming home for only like three and a half days, but he'll be home next weekend. And we had already planned to do our Thanksgiving dinner on Sunday because as everybody with big families know, you never have your holiday on the holiday if you want to have everybody there. Mm -hmm. So it just so happened he'll be back for Thanksgiving, which will be the first time in I, I don't even know how many years. And the plan is for him, his wife, and two children to move back in the spring. So. Oh, it's going to happen? We're praying it's going to happen. You're it's praying. supposed to happen. Okay. And it will happen if I have to drive out there and bring them back. <laughs> Lots of good news. Anyone else? Uh, Stephanie. Just to update everybody, Jay's mom came home from Farmington Village yesterday, so she is officially at home and receiving visitors. She is receiving visitors, okay. Um, I also went to visit Leanne Taylor. Was that this week? I don't know. Life is so crazy right now. This week, I think. So um, she's doing well and also receiving visitors out at the loft. So if you know Leanne, feel free to drop in and see her. She looks great. I've never met her before. We had a nice conversation. So. She used to be a pally. Her dad was Bob Pally. Her dad was Bob Pally. So, um, if you're on the prayer chain, the text chain, um, you received a, a request for prayer for baby Winnie, who we've been praying for for a very, it seems, for 45 days so far. And um, her mom, Sherry, and um, she's not doing well, and they're not expecting her to pull through. So we need to pray for, for Winnie and for Cherie, I knew it as soon as I said Jerry, I said it wrong. For Cherie and everyone who loves them, so, yeah. I'd like to have everyone uh, um, just say a little prayer for Diana. She's having her first cataract surgery on Wednesday, and uh, it's no sweat, but she's worried about it, so sure. obviously, so. Yes. Yes, so prayers for Diana as she has her first cataract surgery this Wednesday. All right, anyone else? Um, I'll, I'll take uh, prayers. <laughs> I'm traveling back and forth and back and forth uh, the next three weeks. This week I'm going back and forth twice. Um, and. Uh, especially next Saturday. I'm uh, responsible for feeding 48 people at a sprinkle. And so I have Friday to drive and prepare and Saturday to do it. And then next Sunday, I am planning to walk and talk. <laughs> I couldn't pull it off this week, but so prayers would be greatly appreciated because I'll get back late Saturday night, so. 
Anyhow, yeah, so that baby is, if you saw my daughter-in-law yesterday, you understand, she's getting ready. <laughs> All right, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this opportunity to pray for one another, to celebrate with one another, to encourage one another to live out our true priorities, for supporting one another, for having occasionally tough conversations in love with one another, for forgiving one another. We thank you for the ways that we are able to find those moments where we go, ooh, I think I did that in the way that Jesus would have wanted me to. And we thank you for those moments where we're able to encourage others to see those times when they have given wholly and genuinely in the way that Jesus would have them do. We thank you for this congregation and the way that it tries to help others serve. We thank you for the many prayers that we are lifting up this morning, both those that are spoken and those that are in our hearts, and we entrust that you will surround those people with your love and your care and your support and we pray oh god that if we're called to be there to minister to them that you will provide us with the energy that we need to do that we thank you most of all for your son jesus christ who sometimes calls us to look at things way differently than the world and we thank you for the humble prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. With glad and generous hearts, let us bring our offerings to God.
How can we thank you, O God, for all that you have done? You give us life, you give us hope, you give us your very self. Take our offerings and our very selves, that your will may be done in our church, in our community, and throughout your wide and beautiful world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 697, Take My Life. and next week we're doing what's called a commissioning and both weeks it'll be responsive so with God's help you will make a difference we will recognize the tested we will notice the suffering we will support the dispirited we will motivate the apathetic we will inspire the faithless we will serve the poorest we will get involved in the movement for justice. God will be at your side. Amen.